Welcome to our VOP Full Poya uh, Dhamma session. Heartfelt good wishes to all of you and on this Uposatha day. So today we're going to be examining the Veda Vitaka Sutta. This is from Majjhimanikaya Discourse number 19. And this is from the Middle Length Discourses. This is a very encouraging teaching from the Buddha because he shares with us his experience as the unenlightened bodhisattva striving for Nibbana. And undoubtedly, we can learn much from this teaching to fuel our own development of the Noble Eightfold Path. So what we're going to cover today is we'll go through our tips and reminders, then we'll introduce this sutta, looking at the sutta architecture and why we really want to study this, this sutta, how we can make the most of it. Then we're going to launch straight in and deep dive into how the unenlightened bodhisattva understood thoughts, because this is what most people are interested in when it comes to meditation. What do we do with these thoughts? And we're going to look at his instruction, particularly in this sutta, for developing and maintaining skilled thoughts as the means to enter into jhana. So skilled thoughts, as we know from our last Dhamma session, is about right intention. So we're going to touch on that again, build on what we looked at in the last session. And when we look at entering and abiding in jhana concentrations, I mean, there's so many suttas where exactly the same instructions are given and we could have looked at that then. But I wanted to take the opportunity to look at it in this particular sutta because it really clarifies around thought. And it probably addresses a lot of the difficulties that people who meditate have when it comes to trying to enter and abide in the, in the jhanas. And then, of course, in the, in the case of the Bodhisattva, he completed the Four Noble Truths, completely understood the Four Noble Truths, attained full liberation, enlightenment, perfectly enlightened all on his own. And, of course, he had the three knowledges. And, of course, we know that the Buddha uh, attained more knowledges than that. And then at the end, we'll, we'll look at this uh, final simile given by the Buddha. He gives a number in this, in this particular teaching. But at the end, he gives this really lovely simile of the deer herd, and it offers encouragement as usual, um, and also a sense of urgency. And I think that's why we come together, is to create that sense of urgency, really inspire each other, encourage each other to keep on the path, keep developing the path. So our usual tips and reminders. So let's keep an open mind. So there may be things that we've heard before, but also new things. Be okay with not understanding everything. I think by now you know that certain things just, they grab you and you know, oh, that one's for me today. And other things maybe not. And then um, we're all learners. And I think this is one of the things about this particular teaching that as trainees, as seekers, there is much to learn from this particular teaching and apply ourselves to the meditation. So we're going to have a short meditation in the middle of this because I think it's good to go over the instructions given by the Bodhisattva. And then we'll use our own example. So as you know, it's always encouraged because that's how you connect with this Dhamma. And of course, we have good wishes for everyone today. We have Metta, Karuna. And also think about all the people that continue to help us, inspire us on this path. There may be people who are not in Dhamma necessarily, but also the people that just support our life this, this passage, this journey to Nibbana. So it's a long, long journey, but just have them in mind as well. So why are we looking at this sutta? So in our last Dhamma session, last Poya, we examined the Mahachatarisika Sutta, wonderful sutta, you know, helping us to understand the Noble Eightfold Path. So how to develop the Noble Right Concentration correctly by activating those seven other path factors, leading with right view. So the Buddha showed us that to train on this right path, you need to have the taintless, supramundane, fully developed path that leads to full liberation. So this teaching in the Deveda Vitaka Sutta, it offers more support towards that. We know from our last session that 
the importance of leading with and establishing the right view, then developing the right intention, so the right kinds of thoughts, followed by the virtue path factors, so right speech, right action, right livelihood. And then what we also emphasized last session was that right view, right effort, and right mindfulness, they work together. The sutta says running and circling each other, and so we looked at that. So when it comes to right intention, as it's purified, it becomes aligned with right view. It, it literally becomes the same as right view. So when we develop skilled thoughts, what we're doing is we're directing and fixing them to right view. So bear that in mind when we go through this particular session. So this Devetha Vitaka Sutta strengthens the effort we make towards developing and maintaining right intention. And the maintaining of right intention is key here. So the Buddha talks about his experience as the Bodhisattva and what he did to purify his thoughts. So abandoning unskillful for the skilled and establishing this noble right intention and then maintaining it. And so this is very similar to also what we touched on on Thalayatana Vibhanga Sutta, that aspect of renunciation, how the joy, sadness, and equanimity of household life, we replace that with the joy, uh, sadness, and the equanimity of renunciation. And so it, it flows in and connects aligns here as well. So for some today, being able to develop right intention is the key because maybe that hasn't been established properly before, still allowing unskillful thoughts to enter and not being able to remove them. While for others, where the spiritual practice is a little bit more mature, the focus may be more on maintaining right intention. So what is true is that we can all benefit from heeding the Buddha slash Bodhisattva's instructions and train in a very similar way to what they have trained or he has trained. So that's what we're going to work through in this session. And when it comes to meditation, there is a mis misconception that it's solely about stopping our thoughts, that um, it's all thoughts. And what we'll see from this particular teaching is that meditation is really about, in the Buddha's case, about the right kind of thinking in order to concentrate the mind, develop the mind. So when you do this correctly, you naturally enter and abide in the, in the jhanas. You move through those four jhanas. And any questions around this will hopefully be resolved as we deep dive into the Bodhisattva's experience. So the Bodhisattva also understood that being able to frequently incline the mind in the direction of Nibbana and not the world was very important. And the more we do that, the easier it is to enter into jhanas and to sharpen our spiritual faculties and realize knowledges. So we're going to take the opportunity during this Dhamma session to study the Buddha's instructions on the four jhanas, entering and abiding in the four jhanas, and to ensure that we understand the process correctly, maybe inform ourselves a little bit more about the process and things that we probably didn't know before, and also why jhana happens. And that's usually, uh, or not usually, it is because we've established the right view. So we don't need to use any gimmicks or artificial keys to enter into the jhanas. All we really need are the Buddha's instructions, whether it's this sutta or another one. And the other part to that is being willing to be instructed to follow the Buddha's method of instruction or those of the noble arahants in other cases. So as some of us already know, this can happen simply by following any of the Buddha's jnanapattas, his insight pathways. So this could be Vatupama, Metta, Dadato Punyam Pavaduti, so the profitable path. It could be Sila Sutta. You know, all these different instructions, usually what we, we notice is the Buddha is always correcting the view and then the rest flows from that. So if you've had difficulty being instructed by instructions such as just let go, relax, get rid of the thoughts, stop all the mental chatter, this part of the session will be very useful because it will clarify some of the difficulties with those kinds of statements. And also as we progress through this particular teaching, it will also clarify it as well. And it usually comes down to understanding the difference between letting go of everything, like every single thought, versus letting go of what is unprofitable and un unskillful. 
And if you have various different blocks to jhanas or maybe having wrong ideas about jhanas or wanting to know each of the four jhanas, then this session will also help to, to look at that. And we'll also look at the three knowledges as well, the knowledge of recollection of past lives, the knowledge of the disappearance and reappearance of beings, and the knowledge of the destruction of the taints as much as we can at least. So these three knowledges are what arose in the Buddha as part of his enlightenment. And we know, of course, that he had further knowledges, further Buddha jnanas as part of his enlightenment. So there are 73 in total, 68 of which are shared with other disciples, but five are very unique to the Buddha. Now, in our case, as Sekas, as trainees, we can reference the Seka Patipada Sutta, so that's Majjhima Nikaya Discourse number 53. In there, you see that the four jhanas and the three knowledges are part of the Seka mode of progress. So these things are important to our gradual training and gradual pro progress. They're not to be discounted saying, oh, we don't need that. We don't need that. It's nothing like that at all. If you want to make progress, it's part and parcel of the training. And this applies to lay people as well as monastics. And if you remember, Seka Padipada Sutta was a teaching that Venerable Ananda gave to lay people at the request of the Buddha. So in terms of the architecture for this sutta, it's broken, you could say, into five parts. So there's the opening statement from the Buddha about his practice um, before enlightenment. And then the Bodhisattva actually talking about dividing these thoughts into two buckets or two classes. And then the Bodhisattva explains that he's understood thoughts which are unwholesome, so essential desire, ill will, and cruelty or harmful thoughts as leading to one's own affliction, to the other's affliction, and to the affliction of both, obstructing wisdom, causing difficulty, and leading away from Nibbana. And then he applies the simile of the cowherd. So we're going to spend a bit of time on that. The next part, or the third part, is the Bodhisattva then understanding thoughts of renunciation. So these are all on the profitable path, thoughts of non-ill will and thoughts of non-cruelty. and knowing, re recognizing that they don't lead to one's own affliction, to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. They actually aid wisdom and they don't cause difficulty and they lead to Nibbana. So very, very, um, that's what should be cultivated. So he again applies the simile of the cowherd. And then the next parts are really about the practice of it and the importance of actively abandoning those unskillful thoughts and developing the skillful thoughts and that's the method that the bodhisattva used to enter and abide in the jhanas and then being able following that establishing a very powerful and strong concentration in his case then being able to direct the mind to the three knowledges so that's quite a chunky part of it and then the last part is this simile of the deer herd and someone coming along and, and showing the safe and right path. So we're going to close with that. So let's go straight in. The opening statement that the Buddha makes is, because before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, it occurred to me, suppose that I divide my thoughts into two classes, then I set on one side thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of cruelty. And I set on the other side thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will, and thoughts of non-cruelty or non-harming. So the Buddha is giving us an account of what occurred to him before his enlightenment. So he is the unenlightened bodhisattva. And he understood that these thoughts fell into two classes or two buckets. In one bucket, there were sensual thoughts, ill will thoughts, and cruel thoughts. In another bucket, there were thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will, or goodwill, if you will, and non-cruelty, non-harming. So that's a very important statement because clearly he has made the distinction between the different kinds of thoughts. On one hand, unskilled thoughts. On another hand, skilled thoughts. So we have to do the same thing. So thoughts were not put into just one bucket and treated the same, treated equal. No, 
They were separated out into two buckets and they need to be treated accordingly. So what we're going to confirm in this next part is that his in instructions on how to actually treat these different classes or buckets of thought, how to evaluate them in order to develop the mind towards the truth, towards Nibbana. So the Buddha goes on to state, as I abided thus, well, in actual fact, this was the Bodhisattva, as I abided thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of sensual desire arose in me. I understood thus. This thought of sensual desire has arisen in me. This leads to my own affliction, to others' affliction, and to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, and leads away from Nibbana. When I considered this, when I considered this leads to my own affliction, it subsided in me. When I considered this leads to others' affliction, it subsided in me. When I considered this leads to the affliction of both, it subsided in me. When I considered this obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, and leads away from Nibbana, it subsided in me. Whenever a thought of sensual desire arose in me, I abandoned it, removed it, did away with it. And then he goes through and says the same thing or thoughts of ill will, and also thoughts of cruelty. So the essence of this is around the unenlightened Bodhisattva's account of how he discerned or classified the class of unprofitable or unskilled thoughts when he was still developing the mind towards Nibbana. So first he says, while he abided diligent, ardent, and resolute. So diligent is apamattasa, so that's vigilant, that's also vigilant. Ardent, uh, the Pali word is atapi, which also means active. So he's actively looking at this. And then pahitatasa is resolute. So he has a strong resolution about what he needs to do. So then he was observing these, these thoughts. So karma vitaka, thoughts of sensuality, viapada vitaka, thoughts of ill will, and vihinsa vitaka, thoughts of cruelty. So the second thing was he understood that these unskilled thoughts lead to affliction or harm. And the Pali word there is biabada. And this also translates not just as affliction or harm, but evil, wrong, hurt. And so this was directed at himself. So atta, biabada, to others, para, biabada, and to both, ubaya, biabada. And then the next part was these unskilled thoughts, they block wisdom, cause problems in the mind and steer, steer him away from Nibbana. So in essence, this is everything that is going against the path that he wants. It means he's still caught in the world, caught in samsara. We can relate to that. So thirdly, he then recognizes when he contemplates in that way by going through about the harm, the blocks to wisdom, causing difficulties and leading away from Nibbana, then he realizes that these thoughts are abandoned, they're removed, they're done away with when he does that contemplation. So what we can understand from this is the importance of being able to recognize and discern, particularly in our meditation when unskilled thoughts arise, and it's not about ignoring these thoughts. It's actually dealing with them in this way, as, as the Bodhisattva has said. So we need to understand that in order to perfectly enlighten, um, the Buddha has actually done this. He's actually actively done this. So he's changed his course from taking delight in the world, which is rooted in greed, hatred, and delusion, and he's now changing course and leaning towards Nibbana. So that's the non-greed part, the non-hate, non-delusion. So we're going to look at each of these unskilled thoughts. So we always talk about uh, karma vitaka, biapada vitaka, and bihinta vitaka. But it's very important because I think sometimes we still indulge. If we're honest, we still indulge in these thoughts. We allow them to come. Unless our meditation is very strong, unless, unless our, our sadda is very strong and we apply very strongly to the meditation, then sometimes we can indulge in these thoughts, particularly if outside of meditation we've been busy and, and doing various things. So with thoughts of sensual desire or sensuality, we know they're rooted in greed. So they're associated with mental defilements like covetousness, wanting, unequal greed. And 
we know that when we have those things in our mind, there is this propensity to have unskilled speech, such as lying, or even taking actions such as taking, taking what is not given. So as an example, if we are imbued with covetous thoughts, it can result in taking what is not given, like stealing something. It, it can be even something very small. But this, what this results in is it gives rights to, to greed. And so we, when there's greed, it gives rights to uh, more unwholesome. So it, it works like that. It's important to see the roots of these things. So another example is if we see a material item that someone else has, and then we know we, we won't be able to afford it or be able to go and get it, but we want it. If we expect some kind of happiness from that, then maybe we we take it. It could be an expensive watch. It could be jewelry. It could be the latest gadget, whatever it is. But you get the idea. You get that greedy type of thing happening. And so you want it. Your mind is circling around it. And at some point, we might decide to take it. So greed has arisen and now we've lost our virtue. And by taking what is not given, then it, we feel more greedy thoughts and it doesn't necessarily stop there. And so in our meditation, we may not be in real life doing this, but that's just an example of how this process works. And so the fact that we're born into the world is a testament to this karma vitaka. So it is unskillful for this reason. It increases the greed path, and that's why it's harmful to us. And if we do all these unwholesome things that are rooted in greed, whether it's through speech or action, again, it's harmful to us as well as harmful to others. If we take something that has not been given or if we lie to someone, if we put ourselves in their shoes, then we know that there, there is harm or hurt done to another person. Now, what we also remember with sensual desire is that it's a hindrance. And so there are many teachings from the Buddha and the Noble Arahants about the danger in sensual pleasures. The simile that the Buddha uses normally for the hindrance of sensual desire is debt. So you, you can see that in the Mahaasapura Sutta. When you view it as debt in the mind, we stay debt bound to greed. Or in a literal sense, we might have to fund sensual pleasures by working. And when it isn't enough, we take loans and there's interest charged and it's a whole painful process. The world is a great example of debt, of sensual desire and debt. How much pain, how much dukkha is experienced and endured at an individual level, family level, company level, country level, and then the global level. So if we take what hasn't been given, if we lie, if we stand in the shoes of other people, then we know what it's like. There is hurt and harm to both. So in the greater scheme of things, when we look at it, um, what we see is that it blocks and obstructs wisdom. The mind is imbued with unwholesome thoughts, thoughts that are associated with wrong view, wrong path, and wrong practice. How can wisdom grow? This thought itself is alarming because the Buddha's path is a wisdom path. So if we block wisdom, it's terrible for us. Instead, what grows is ignorance and the mind is unsettled, difficult to tame, and we remain far away from the non-greed path, which is what is leading to Nibbana. Then when it comes to thoughts of ill will, these are rooted in hatred. These thoughts are associated with mental defilements, including ill will, anger, hostility, stinginess. And it leads to unskilled speech as well. It could be harsh speech or divisive speech and physical actions such as violence, killing living beings. These thoughts arise primarily because we expect pleasure, whether it's from an object, a person or an experience, but it didn't last or it didn't fulfill our expectations. So we ended up with dukkha. So for example, if we are imbued with hostile thoughts, it may result in bad speech physical violence. This gives rise to more hatred. Hatred gives rise to more hostile thoughts, speech, and harmful actions. So if we're holding a grudge towards someone and something has happened in the past, then hostility can be very strong towards the person. And that may be what comes up in the meditation time and time again. We may then actually in real life use harsh speech when we encounter them. So hatred arises and now we've lost our virtue. And again, it doesn't end there. It usually escalates 
and it can escalate to physical altercation and then fueled by further ill will thoughts, giving rise to more hatred and on and on it goes. So the walls of the world that we see, they start with thoughts of ill will, anger, hostility, and it escalates. So you can see what is taking over the world in that respect. So it's unskillful for that reason. Harmful to us, harmful to others, harmful to both. And don't forget that ill will as a hindrance is seen as sickness. So this is also Maha Asapura Sutta. When we contemplate it, we can see that it is a sickness in the mind when there's ill will. And of course, the world is very imbued with this. And like the world, if we continue to want pleasure or happiness constantly, then we end up in Dukkha. So we see mundane examples of this in our life, and those are the ones that probably come up in meditation. But we can also see the bigger predicament with all of these. No matter what we do, we can't control the process of birth, aging, sickness, and death. This is our predicament. Breeding ill will does not change that, nor does it help the predicament. So it's better for us to develop wisdom, to comprehend the predicament and go beyond ill will. So from the perspective of hurting or harming others, thoughts of ill will that leads to harsh speech or divisive speech or violent actions, these are the things that are harmful to others. No one likes to be on the receiving end of any of that. We wouldn't like and other people wouldn't like. And in the grand scheme of things, of course, it's harmful to both. So again, you see these things, they will block wisdom. Uh, the mind will be imbued with more ignorance. In fact, it's ignorance that grows and this non-hate path is very far away from us. Now, the interesting one is thoughts of cruelty because people, including myself, have often wondered about cruelty and thoughts of cruelty are rooted in delusion. So when you really contemplate delusion, these thoughts are associated with mental defilements including derogation, so makkha, palasa, disparaging, obstinacy, competition, conceit, arrogance, and all these things they lead to also unskilled speech, so idle chatter in particular, this frivolous talk, and then also misconduct, such as sexual misconduct or drinking alcohol. Often these things are fueled by, by delusion. So people often ask the question, what's the difference between thoughts of ill will and thoughts of cruelty or harm? Are they the same? And most people think they are the same. But to understand the distinction made by the Buddha, you need to look at the unwholesome roots. So while thoughts of ill will are rooted in hatred, thoughts of cruelty or harm are rooted in delusion. Delusion is normally associated with wrong views and wrong thoughts, perceptions of me and mine, permanency. And so when we have these kinds of skilled thought, unskilled thoughts, our speech and actions are very deluded because we're holding strongly to something, to, to these strong views. And what we value in terms of when we have this delusion is the result of cruelty we don't see. So it can sound like I'm right, you're wrong. My ideas are better than your ideas. My group is better than your uh, group. I have a preference for this, not that. And when we say these things out, inadvertently, we don't realize how hurtful or harmful they can be. Delusion is always imbued with boundaries, preferences, likes, dislikes, and then holding very fast to them. And then they inevitably hurt others. So an example would be if we held the belief in a certain kind of politics, the most obvious example, we identify with one particular party over another. And so when we speak on politics, which the Buddha labels as unbeneficial talk, it's not talk that leads to Nibbana. It's talk that's still deluded by the world, these relative truths of the world. And the more we talk like that about politics, the more delusion increases. And that's hurtful to us. And when you increase delusion, you're inclined to more frivolous talk. We may even harm others by that kind of talk. You know, you see it when someone doesn't agree with you, but they're listening. You're, you're also getting into altercation or whether it's verbal or otherwise. So it's considered cruel or harmful because when you value one thing over another, someone always loses out in that, 
in that preference, in that value judgment. If we take US politics as an example, if you raise Democrats over Republicans or Republicans over Democrats, either way, there's cruelty if you sit on one side of the fence or another. If you take any topic in the news at the moment, you see the roots of delusion and you often see one group pitted against another group. And so all these knowledges and valuation, these worldly things over a wide range of topics are rooted, rooted in delusion. And they're very unskillful because they increase the delusion power. So we can see the world is very much imbued with this delusion and ignorance. And the world can't fathom how dire the predicament is being born into samsara for this very reason. It's so interested. It gets very involved, excited about these things, not knowing how harmful it is to oneself, to others, to both. If we as practitioners following the Buddha's path take delight in the world in this way, that means we give value to worldly things, worldly subjects, worldly matters. These are things that the Buddha is teaching us are false, deceptive in nature. If we allow ourselves to, to keep on with those subjects, we remain duped, misled by those things. We lose sight of the ultimate truth, lose sight of our bigger predicament, lose sight of wanting to find the ending of all suffering. So there are mundane examples from life like that, but there's also the bigger predicament as we always remind ourselves that no matter what we do, we can't control this process of birth, aging, sickness, and death. Breeding thoughts about cruelty and harm, all these various top topics, if we inevitably value them, certain mundane dhammas over other mundane dhammas, it's harmful to us. It's harmful because it leads to more defilements. It could, could lead to more conceit and arrogance. We raise ourselves, lower others over these mundane dhammas. It could lead to stubbornness, mental rigidity. We might compete with people and so on. They reinforce at their root the sense of me and mine, what I know, what I like, what I think, and also a sense of permanency. We fix people and things to what we think is true, these relative mundane numbers. But in actual fact, we get further duped, trapped, and blocked. You know, our wisdom suffers. It, it doesn't change or help the predicament. So it's better for us to develop the wisdom that Buddha talks about, the wisdom of the path leading to Nibbana, then to try and figure out all these things. And from this perspective of harming others, none of the things, if we were to allow frivolous talk on, on all these unbeneficial topics, none of it leads to Nibbana. So we end up misleading other people. If you're someone that wants to present a good example in terms of being able to renunciate the world, then you don't want to be presenting this bad example of being so interested in deluded topics. And knowingly or unknowingly, if, you, if, if we end up doing that, then what happens is we are encouraging indirectly people to stay stuck in samsara. And indulging in such talk normally also goes along with indulging in alcohol. Alcohol loosens the lips in order to indulge in that kind of talk. And it goes in a circular kind of way as well. When we listen and get involved in such talk, sometimes it doesn't register as harmful because that's the convention. That's the norm. That's how we've been conditioned from birth when we start to chat with people. So there may really genuinely be delight in such talk. But when the spiritual path starts to develop, we really start to see the link to delusion, the link to ignorance. And so when you start to refrain from it, you start to really see the meditation, the development of the mind uh, start to accelerate. And one thing, one obvious thing you notice is if you indulge in a lot of that kind of talk, that's what reverberates in the mind and that's what is difficult to purify the, the mind of. And so when you start refraining, it just makes the, the job easier in terms of developing the concentration. The other important part to this is if we raise worldly ideas above Nibbana, that's maka of Nibbana, that's belittling Nibbana. And that, of course, is very harmful 
to ourselves and to others if we, if we are doing that. So the important thing is to recognize that and then decide I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to belittle Nibbana. And the reason also why it belittles it is because we start to forget the predicament. We forget that birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering, and so on. We forget to arouse the sense of urgency. And we get fully absorbed into politics, celebrity, uh, all kinds of material things, and all these various topics in the world. So if one has insight and you don't want to belittle Nibbana, then what you need to do is, is refrain. And so that becomes very, very clear. And if you have a very strong intention for liberation, then you don't want to block wisdom. You don't want to do that. And so in the greater scheme of things, um, you start to re it really starts to come together that these types of things are actually really bad from, for uh, ruining the right view because you start to lose that and you start to grab onto wrong view. And so therefore you just say, oh, I don't want to do that. And I don't want to grow the ignorance. I want to, to grow the wisdom. And I don't want to be far away from the non-delusion path if I cultivate those thoughts. So all three kinds of unskilled thoughts, thoughts of sensual desire, ill will, and cruelty, the Buddha is actually really saying that they're harmful. And if you deeply contemplate that you really do see it and the fact that it blocks wisdom the word that the in pali is panya nirodiko and nirodika or nirodiko it means obstructs but it can also mean destroy so when you have this idea that you're destroying your own wisdom you feel awful you think i don't i really don't want to do this so i'm really going to to um drop drop those kinds of thoughts, it's actually very powerful. And then causing difficulties, vigata, pakiko. So vigata is also destructive, distress, annoyance, trouble. So really we're creating trouble for ourselves with these kinds of thoughts. And the other part of it is we remain duped by samsara. That, that's the, the problem. And there we, therefore we're still stuck with the whole mass of suffering. And the last statement is about leading away from Nibbana. And the Pali is Anibbana Samvataniko. So that also means not conducive to Nibbana. It makes sense. So it's really important to contemplate each part of that, that we don't want to harm. So ourselves, others, and both. We don't want to block wisdom. We don't want to be troubled or you know, cause difficulties for ourselves. And we don't want to be led away from Nibbana. So this is the medicine that's been given for unskilled thoughts to subside. So what I'd like to do is do a short meditation. So on this particular slide, it's exactly what we just went through. All we need to do is really just take one of our own examples, just one of any kind of unskillful thought, and think of something that comes up in your meditation like readily comes up in your meditation, whether it's sensual desire, ill will, or cruelty. And again, whether it's um, lay householders or monastics, it's always real examples. You know, they're, they're always something there. If it's sensual thoughts, it's about food, people, material objects, receiving gifts, even travel. Ill will usually associated with a person or a situation that, that's happened before. Someone you think has harmed you. Is, is still harming you or will harm you. And then cruelty is, well, there's so many options about politics, diet, science, royalty, the economy, uh, politicians, whatever it is. So pick an example that has come up in your meditation and go through what the, the Buddha Bodhisattva has said. Think of this method of instruction and see it subsides, like actually contemplate it and see it subside. The reason I want to do this is because usually when we take on an instruction from the Buddha, sometimes we end up parroting it without penetrating it. So I'd just like to take maybe 10 minutes, yeah, maybe 10 minutes just to go through and, and see what comes up. So let's do that now. There on Saturday.
Peruan Saranai, we can come out of the meditation or contemplation. So if you used an example, you probably saw that it is challenging if we indulge in those thoughts, but also how powerful that this method of instruction is. Whether it's around the harm that it causes to ourselves, others, or both, I think the one that is really interesting is always about the destruction of wisdom, the blocking of wisdom. You know, this this is a wisdom path, and so if you block wisdom, then it's a it's a real problem. So if you've seen it and you start applying it, whether it's in the meditation, definitely in the meditation, but you can also apply it in everyday life just running through this sequence of instruction can be very helpful to drop things which are not necessarily good for us. And the experience of it can be quite wonderful because then you start to see some maturity in how we practice. Because sometimes what happens is we can indulge and forget. And I think sometimes when you think about this is what the Bodhisattva did before he was enlightened, a very good example for us because the words that are used is that he is striving vigilantly actively with a firm resolve and if we follow in those footsteps of how the bodhisattva was thinking and how he's practicing it can be very valuable for us so i encourage to practice this particular aspect of the meditation So the next part, what said is bhikkhus, whatever bhikkhu frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of his mind. If we frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of sensual desire, he has abandoned the thought of renunciation to cultivate the thought of sensual desire. And then his mind inclines to the thoughts of sensual desire. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of ill will, upon thoughts of cruelty, all of those things, he has abandoned the thought of non-cruelty. So in many ways, um, it's looking at both or all three different aspects. Then his mind inclines to those thoughts of cruelty. So essentially what we what is said here is that if we frequently think about all these unprofitable things, then we've abandoned all the profitable one. So it's a really wonderful statement because if we frequently think and ponder, or whatever we frequently think and ponder, this becomes the inclination of the mind. That's so straightforward, but something we need to seriously take on board. So in Pali, the word that's used is bahula manuvitakati anuvacharati. So this is whatever we think and examine much of or whatever thoughts we are devoted to. So if we frequently think unskilled thoughts, then our mind is going to be inclined towards the unprofitable direction, greed, hatred, and delusion. So this is confirmed when it says, if we frequently indulge in thoughts of sensual desire, we cut off thoughts of renunciation. The mind keeps inclining towards thoughts of sensual desire. Likewise, if we frequently indulge in thoughts of ill will, we cut off thoughts of non-ill will, and therefore the mind inclines to ill will. And then if we frequently indulge in thoughts of cruelty or harm, we cut off those that are non-cruel, non-harmful, and then we're inclining in that wrong, unprofitable direction. So the process is a very damaging one and very explicit. We may not have clearly recognized that before, that it's it's that, that straightforward and that damaging. So again, when you think about the earlier part, how we were saying it's harmful, this really hits home why it is harmful. We're actually indulging in unskillful and cutting off skillful. So cutting off wisdom. So we've already seen this through the inside pathway in the Vatupama Sutta as an example. So if we don't remove mental stains, we can expect if you follow the, the Buddha's teaching in the Vatupama Sutta that upon death with the break of the body, rebirth in a bad destination can be expected. But if we admit to these mental stains or defilements, see the folly in them, the danger in cultivating those mental defilements that lead to a bad destination, then we make a strong determination to purify. We abandon them, remove them, then we're free. So that means we have cut off unskillful and therefore we have access to skillful. So in different meditations, you can see exactly 
the same thing that is being explained. So back to this sutta, the Buddha goes on to say, just as in the last month of the rainy season, in the autumn when the crops thicken, a cow herd would guard his cows by constantly tapping and poking them on this side and that with a stick to check and curb them. Why is that? Because he sees that he could be flogged, imprisoned, fined or blamed if he let them strain to the crops. So too, I saw in unwholesome states danger, degradation and defilement and in wholesome states the blessing of renunciation, the aspect of cleansing. So this is a good simile because it it shows us what we must do. We have to be like the cow herd. We have to keep tapping and poking ourselves and checking and ensuring that we're not indulging in cultivating unskilled thoughts. And it's an active process. It's an active mental process because we see the cow herd is constantly guarding the cows in that way. And why he does that is because if the cow strain to the crops, He's in danger of being flogged, imprisoned, fined, or blamed. So that entails some degree of suffering. Likewise for us, if we don't see the danger, degradation, and defilement of unskilled thoughts, so these unwholesome mental states, then as a result, um, we wouldn't actively guard the mind from them. And therefore, we would experience some measure or degree of pain and suffering. So the Buddha, the, the words that the Buddha uses here in Pali are akusalana, damana, adinava, okara, sankilesa. So we've heard these words before, in particular, in the gradual instructions to lay people about sensual pleasures. So if you recall, there are a number, there's so many suttas about the danger in sensual pleasures and Buddha uses various similes. But one of the ones that is really good is this alagada mupama sutta. So I think this is the simile of the snake. And in this particular sutta, there's a group of bhikkhus who are trying to correct the pernicious view of another bhikkhu. And they're reminding him of the Buddha's words regarding sensual pleasures. So what they say to him is, the blessed one has stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and despair. And that danger in them is still more with the simile of the skeleton, with the simile of the piece of meat, with the simile of the grass torch, with the simile of the charcoal pit, with the simile of the dream, with the simile of the borrowed goods, with the simile of the fruits on a tree, with the simile of the butcher's knife and block. I mean, some of those are also from Potaliya Sutta. And with the simile of the sword stake and the simile of the snake's head, the blessed one has stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. And so there, there are more suttas that are very, very similar to that. When we contemplate any of those similes that the Buddha has given for the danger, degradation and defilement of sensual pleasures, what we come to realize is that more often than, than not, we're misapprehending sensual pleasures, the suba aspect of it. We don't see our suba, we see suba. So beauty or pleasing instead of repulsive and displeasing. So when we misapprehend the, the gratification, the fleeting gratification we get from sensual pleasures, then it, it cuts off seeing the danger, degradation and defilement of them. And so as a result, we go towards, in one example, the charcoal pit, we go towards the snake head, we go towards the skeleton, the fruit tree, the, you know, we're always dreaming. And when it comes to sensual pleasures, we tend to measure and evaluate, you know, develop these strong preferences, strong likes and dislikes. And so due to those preferences and tendencies, we're always expecting pleasure or happiness. And we're very averse to pain or suffering, which is ironic, really, because what we feel or experience as pleasurable usually ends in suffering. But also we end up perceiving it as me and mine. So we really lose sight of the right view we keep going towards what is actually wrong view you know we we also don't see the impermanent nature of sensual pleasures so there's a lot of loss happening and then of course misconduct can happen as well and so we lo lose our our virtue at that point now when the reference is made to um experiencing fear we usually fear because we, of what we take as as me and mine so we usually fear that we lose things through fire, water, kings, thieves, and displeasing airs. And, you know, what, what happens is the greatest fear is the fear of, of, of having to suffer. 
And that is what is driving that. So when it comes to the danger, degradation and defilement of sensual pleasures, we need to make sure we apprehend this correctly. And the only way to do it is to really see these unskilled thoughts, um, whether it is about sensual pleasures to begin with, but it also then turns into ill will and, of course, to cruel, cruelty thoughts. And if we don't nip them in the bud, they tend to grow, multiply, and they lead to our decline. So it's very important that we actually, we can't afford to let them take hold. So this is particularly important. Our meditation becomes wasteful in many ways, almost futile, if we keep indulging in unskillful. Because we could sit for hours and hours and hours, but what are we training in? We're training in defilements, unskilled states, not the wholesome skilled states. So what is profitable that leads to liberation is what is important, but if we haven't removed some of these unskilled states, then we're actually practicing what is unprofitable. So that's something to have a strong reminder about, to actually be able to nip it in the bud. Now, back to the Devetha Vitaka Sutta, it then says, as I abided thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of renunciation arose in me. I understood thus, this thought of renunciation has arisen in me. This does not lead to my own affliction or to others' affliction or to the affliction of both. It aids wisdom, does not cause difficulties and leads to Nibbana. If I think and ponder upon this thought, even for a night, even for a day, even for a night and day, I see nothing to fear from it. But with excessive thinking and pondering, I might tire my body. And when the body is tired, the mind becomes strained. And when the mind is strained, it is far from concentration. So I steadied my mind internally, quieted it, brought it to singleness and concentrated it. Why is that? So that my mind should not be strained. And then it goes on to say the same for thoughts of non-ill will and of, of course, thoughts of non-cruelty. So what we see now from the Bodhisattva's meditation is that when thoughts of sensual desire are abandoned, thoughts of renunciation arise. He understood that this is non-harmful. So before we saw, saw that sensual desire, ill will thinking and cruelty thinking, they're all harmful to himself, to others and to both. But when these profitable, skillful thoughts arise, they're non-harmful. So when thoughts of renunciation arise, they aid wisdom. So in, in many ways, this is blocking the ignorance. And they don't cause difficulties and they lead to Nibbana. And then the same understanding for thoughts of non-ill will and thoughts of non-cruelty. So when the Buddha, when the Bodhisattva says he sees nothing to fear from thoughts of renunciation, non-ill will and non-cruelty, it's because he's inclining towards abandoning craving in his meditation. So he's getting rid of craving for sensual pleasures, existence and non-existence. You know, we know that craving is the origin of suffering. So if craving is abandoned, we're experiencing cessation of suffering. Fear and suffering are synonymous. So our greatest fear is suffering. And so when we have the cessation of suffering, there's nothing to fear. So that's what he means by that. Another way of looking at it is with the thoughts of renunciation, he's abandoned thoughts of sensual desire. So he doesn't expect pleasure. And he's not taking anything as me and mine. If you're not taking anything as me and mine, you don't go the wrong way with fear. So you remember that from the, the Manosang Chetanahara, mental volition as nutriment. If, you, if you're not taking it as me and mine because you're not seeking the pleasure, then you don't develop that wrong view and you don't go the wrong way. By agati, you don't go that way. So when you have the right view, then there's no fear. So when the Bodhisattva says, but with excessive thinking and pondering, I might tire my body. And when my body is tired, the mind becomes strained. And when my mind is strained, it's far from concentration. His reference is being able to abide in a skilled state without any unskilled states and using that method uh, that we've been going through for a long time. However, generating that type of thinking and pondering in excess, it tires out the body, it strains the mind. And so it makes it difficult to concentrate. And so to overcome this, what we'll see is that the Bodhisattva then steadies his mind internally, quieted, quieted it, brought it to singleness and concentrated it. 
So here we see that he's talking about entering and abiding in jhanas. And we're going to discuss that in a short little while. Uh, but we'll just finish off this section first. So the next bit is bhikkhus, whatever a bhikkhu frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of his mind. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of renunciation, he has abandoned the thought of sensual desire to cultivate the thought of renunciation, and then his mind inclines to the thoughts of renunciation. And then it says the same thing for non-ill will and the same for non-cruelty. You end up abandoning the thoughts of ill will and the thoughts of cruelty. And so your mind is inclining towards the thoughts of non-ill will and the thoughts of non-cruelty as well. So this is, again, the same wonderful statement that it's correcting our view, being able to see that, that we're now leaning in the profitable direction. We've cut off the unprofitable, as opposed to earlier when we had cut off the profitable and were staying in, in the world, in samsara, in the unprofitable part. So the reference he then gives is again to this same cowherd, but this time he says, just as in the last month of the hot season, when all the crops have been brought inside the villages, a cowherd would guard his cows while staying at the root of a tree or out in the open, since he needs only to be mindful that the cows are there. So too, there was need for me only to be mindful that those states were there. So if we reference what we've learned from the Mahachatavisaka Sutta, we know that the three states, right view, right effort, right mindfulness, they run in circle around each other. So this is how the Bodhisattva maintains the skilled thought. He doesn't need to do much more. His mindfulness is guarding and right effort has done its job. Right view has already been established. So it's really a, a guarding uh, process. So Four Noble Truths is active. Uh, his determination for Nibbana in the Bodhisattva's case is active. He has applied the right effort and the right mindfulness is, is actively guarding, affirming the right view. So right mindfulness is really directing, fixing the mind to the same right view, not allowing unskilled, unwholesome states to, to enter. So if the bodhisattva's mind continues to construct the skilled state, he fixes on it, he mentally directs towards it and applies himself to it, which is what what he's doing in order to enter into the right concentration. So from Mahachatarisaka Sutta, what's really evident here is that his right intention is at the forefront. You know, so he has the right view, but the right intention is right at the forefront. And so the words for uh, noble right intention, if you remember, is takko vitakko sankapo appana viapana chetaso abhininiropana Vajisankaro. So that translates as thinking or reasoning, thought, intention, mental absorption, or directing one's mind, mental fixity, applying the mind, and verbal formations. So what the Bodhisattva is training, as we spoke about last poya, is in this Deveda Vitaka Sutta, he sees unskilled thoughts as harmful, obstructing wisdom, causing difficulties, leading away from Nibbana. So he's abandoned them and he's developing these skilled ones, which do not harm and they aid wisdom. They actually are very helpful and they lead towards Nibbana. So he's fixing onto skilled thoughts. He's fixing his skilled thoughts to the right view. And this also aligns with what we said about the Salayatana Vibhanga Sutta, just to, for completeness, to, to put that in there as well, is He's about to use the support of renunciation, joy, sadness, and equanimity to abandon the household joy, sadness, and equanimity. So this is the encouragement from the Buddha Bodhisattva to enter and remain in the higher concentrations that come as a result of solitude from central pleasures, solitude from unwholesome states. So you, you see it all come together. That repetition that you find in multiple suttas is lovely. It actually says we're all on the right track. It's all coming together. And so if you're not seeing it, that's okay. But but it's like when you see it, you think, wow, that's how it works. That's how it really works. It's replicated. You can see it. So let's now go into the jhanas, the four jhanas. So this next section is really around 
the process that the bodhisattva uses to enter into jhana. And it builds on what we've just been through with, with skilled thoughts as opposed to unskilled thoughts. And what we'll read out is really that this is the standard method that you see across many, many suttas. Now, we'll begin with the first paragraph, which says, tireless energy was aroused in me. So this is the bodhisattva. An unremitting mindfulness was established. My body was tranquil and untroubled. My mind concentrated and unified. So aradang ko paname bikawe viriyang ahosi asalinang apita apatita sati asamutta pasado kayo asarado samahitang chitang ekagang. So what that says is that there's active energy aroused by the bodhisattva. That's what we, we've read out in English and in Pali. And it's something that we probably cannot quite fathom. Like we talk about active energy and we go, yeah, we, we know what that means. But this is the Bodhisattva talking and we know he is about to enlighten. So the uh, quality that he he's using, this arada, is really this arada video that we know is a sacred quality. Arada video we know is active aroused energy, uh, being very energetic. So there's a firmness in his effort. There's no slacking off from the goal of Nibbana. And he's actively removing any unskilled states and developing and protecting his skilled states. That's what's encompassed in this first part. And you see that if you put your mind to the to what the Bodhi, un, unenlightened bodhisattva needs to do in order to perfectly enlighten all on his own and become the Buddha, you see, it must take a, a lot. And remember, on the night of this particular account, he his effort was so phenomenal. Uh, he meditated continuously without getting up from where he was sitting until he realized Nibbana. So his perseverance as part of that effort, that energy was so great, was so vast was so much I mean if you just think to yourself could you imagine sitting there and saying I'm not going to get up until I realize Nibbana I, I'm let alone just following in the Bodhisattva the Buddha's footsteps it's just it's just amazing you, you just wouldn't think um, like for us we would think oh maybe it's quite impossible but it's such a feat that this this first part and so the answer is that it's actually still hard for us to fathom and even harder for us to incline to what the bodhisattva and the noble arahant have succeeded in it's not impossible to do but it's just that in our minds it still feels like such a massive thing and of course it is but it's like wow so i think even a small contemplation of seeing it that way just trying to get closer to the effort that the bodhisattva has is very inspiring. It's an encouragement. Even if we have 1% of what the bodhisattva had on the night of his enlightenment, that I'm sure that would, would pack a whole punch that would probably fuel us for, for weeks and weeks and days and days and days. So clearly the bodhisattva had this un, unremitting or unshaken mindfulness. Now, that was established for him. He had his active guard on duty that was in place and there was no, no room for him to have any sluggishness, forgetfulness, confusion, all those things that usually come, very similar to sloth and torpor, all that. None of that was there. Only clarity, lucidity and, and sharp alertness, I would say. So as he, removed, as he moved through the jhanas, his body became tranquil, at ease, and untroubled. You know, asarado means undisturbed. Undisturbed. It could also mean cool, so not warm or, or not excited. So it's quite calm and quite contained. And so then the Bodhisattva goes on to explain the jhanas. So we'll go bit by bit. I won't read out the whole lot. I'll, I'll go bit by bit. The first part is quite secluded from sensual pleasures. Secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. 
So this very much sounds like what we know of Adi Chittasika, the higher training and concentration. All those component parts are there. You're secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, and then you go through the jhanas. Now, before we get into that, it's good to point out that if as part of your practice you cultivate generosity, cu cultivate virtue, then it also plays a part that is very helpful towards developing jhana. So if you've been generous, and you've kept good virtue by body, speech, and mind, that's a very good foundation for developing the mind. You need that. Otherwise, you get kicked out of jhana or you find it very difficult um, as a process of developing the mind because, you know, the, the misconduct is what needs to be purified. So putting that to one side, based on what we've read out, how do we actually attain to the first jhana based on that little description? So we start with Savitaka Savichara. So this is translated here as applied and sustained thought. So Vitaka can be translated as thinking, reflecting, initial application, and of course, this applied thought. It has the characteristic of fixity, so fixing to an object or something of that nature and steadying on it. And Vichara, this is translated as investigation, examination, consideration, deliberation, or sustained application, as well as this sustained thought. So the characteristic for Vichara is very much about movement. So for ease of explaining during this session, I think I'll simply use thinking and examining for Vitaka and Vichara. I find it easier just to use those terms. So the Pethakopadesa, the Pithika disclosure is really good because it gives some similes to help us to understanding this process of Vitaka Vichara, thinking and examining. The first simile is, uh, is when we see someone coming towards us in the distance and we don't yet know whether it is a man or a woman. But when we get the perception that it is a man or a woman, they are of such a color or shape, they have that kind of thing, then our thinking is that that's thinking that's vitaka as we are thinking we then scrutinize a bit more we go back to the object and we try and figure out is this man or woman virtuous or unvirtuous are they rich or poor you know what are the other signs and features we can glean by examining so in thinking we fix on the object in examining we wander about the object that that object we fix on and, and turn it in our mind so that's that process it gives you an idea so thinking is the process of fixing on the object and approaching while examining is figuring out the signs and features of that fixed object. The second simile that the Pethakopadesa gives is just as when a winged bird first accumulates speed and after accumulating speed is able to glide. Thinking is like the accumulation of speed and examining is like the outstretched wings as the bird glides. So in this case, thinking has this momentum to it to achieve steadiness. So it, it gathers uh, momentum and then it steadies. Examining makes the most of that and then it moves, moves to like how a bird would glide. It just has that movement. So this second simile particularly resonates with the process of entering into the first jhana. So if we take our own example of contemplating the first noble truth, we can also see how thinking and examining or Vitaka Vichara works. So when we think that the Buddha has taught the first noble truth and that they have the 12 terms that begin with birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering, and so on. This is the thinking. This is Vitaka. If we think about the first term, birth is suffering, and we uh, fix our mind to that, and then we start examining, we would go, how is birth suffering? And then what would come up is, Birth in hell is suffering. Birth in animal realm is suffering. Birth in the plane of departed is suffering and so on. So if we keep doing that, you can see that there is the thinking and examining happening, this initial and sustained thought. Likewise, you can also see it if you take an example, say, for example, our short meditation on, is it worth taking as me and mine? So we think about the instructions for the meditation, which is, if it is impermanent, suffering and subject to change, is it worth taking as me and mine? That's the thinking. The exploring comes in when we contemplate what is impermanent. And then you consider, oh, the body is impermanent, or it could be the other aggregates are impermanent. Then you realize it's unlasting. There is suffering. And then 
It, is it subject to change? Well, of course, the body ages, it ripens. So yes, it's subject to change. So yes, it is impermanent suffering and subject to change. Therefore, it is not worth taking as me and mine. That's the contemplation. But you can see that vitaka vichara is happening. So if we take that contemplation further of coming back as a baby, the outcome is still the same when we do the vitaka vichara. Wrong view is being replaced with the right view, right intention. These thoughts are aligned with right view. So we have the thinking and examining in most of these teachings that the Buddha give, any of these um, sutta meditations that we do, they all help us, as we know, to enter into jhana. So that's that's good. That's the, We know how we do it. We know why we, we don't think there's too many problems with entering into jhana. So if we apply this to this sutta that we're looking at today, this the Veda, Vitaka Sutta, then the contemplation that the Bodhisattva used is also the same thinking and examining in order to develop the profitable path. He's thinking thoughts of renunciation, you know, fulfilling non-greed. And when he does that, he's secluded from sensual pleasure. He's thinking thoughts of non-ill will and fulfills non-hate. And then thinking thoughts of non-cruelty or the non-harm, and that fulfills the non-delusion. And so when you have the thoughts of non-ill will and non-cruelty, you're secluded from wholesome states. We are not giving any attention to unprofitable in that case. You're giving up the sensual desire thinking, the ill will thinking, the cruelty thinking. And you can see that the close examination of those kinds of thoughts is how the bodhisattva enters into jhana because he drops the unskilled and he's holding on to the skilled through the examination of that method. It's harmful. It doesn't aid wisdom or blocks wisdom. It causes difficulties, leads away from nibbana. That's the examining of, of each of those thoughts through that process. He enters into jhana. So clearly you need skilled thoughts to overcome unskilled thoughts to enter into the first jhana. So here, what's really interesting is not about stopping all thoughts. So if you've been instructed before, just stop thinking. The Bodhisattva clearly has divided into two classes of thoughts at the beginning and valued one set of thoughts, which is the skilled thoughts, and is developing them and is getting rid of the other ones, the unskilled thoughts. Now, if you try to stop all thoughts, whether it's by asking your mind very nicely or by forcing it, the mind usually pushes back, it revolts, you know, and, and then the mind gets flooded with thoughts, usually of the um, unskillful type. And that's because you haven't, well, we haven't established right view and right intention is not purified. So you can see if you simply follow the instructions of the Buddha, it's safer, it's easier. If you passively push the mind into thinking, just let go, relax, be peaceful, that actually can be quite obstructive because it leads you wrong path, wrong practice, wrong concentration, because you haven't done anything to actively pursue the non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion path. So you're likely to be rooted still in greed, hatred, and delusion. So you might still get to concentration, but because the right view hasn't been established, it's unlikely that it's noble right concentration that the Buddha is talking about. And if you use artificial keys, NLP, other tricks, you might also get some kind of concentration, but you haven't applied the Buddha's medicine, uh, the, these, these instructions. And so again, risk of wrong path, wrong practice, and, and still remaining bound to the world. You know, there won't be this liberation that the Buddha talks about. So this Deveda Vitaka Sutta highlights very well the Bodhisattva's experience and helps to clarify some of the misconceptions about different instructions that people give. What we really need to do is to make sure we skillfully direct the mind to the profitable path leading to the right view or leading with the right view. And it, then it really becomes the wisdom path that the Buddha speaks of. So if we've become successful with the bodhisattva's instruction, we are now secluded from sensual pleasures, unwholesome states, and we enter into the first jhana. We experience the rapture and happiness, the piti sukha, born of this seclusion. As the bodhisattva says, whatever we frequently think and ponder upon, that will become the inclination of the mind. So in this case, we've been thinking and pondering on skilled states. So 
renunciation, non ill will, non cruelty. So we're inclining towards towards all of that, inclining towards nibbana. When we enter into the first jhana, we abandon five factors, and we possess five other factors. So th this has been explained actually in Mahavedala Sutta. So that's Majjhimanikaya discourse number 43, as well as also in the Pethakul Vedesa. When Venerable Mahakotita asked Venerable Sariputta, friend, how many factors are abandoned in the first jhana and how many factors are possessed? And Venerable Sariputta answers, friend, in the first jhana, five factors are abandoned and five factors are possessed. And then he says, here, when a bhikkhu has entered into the first jhana, sensual desire is abandoned, ill will is abandoned, sloth and torpor are, ab are abandoned, and restlessness and remorse are abandoned, and doubt is abandoned. And there occur applied thought, sustained thought. So this is the thinking and examining, rapture, pleasure, and unification of mind. This is how in the first jhana, five factors are abandoned and five factors are possessed. So when we enter into the first jhana, we abandon the five hindrances. So those, if you remember from the Vija Sutta, are the nutriment for ignorance. So this is one before. We're no longer feeding ignorance, fueling ignorance. In the jhanas, we're actually um, unobstructed now. And so we're clearly cutting off what the Buddha calls the complete heap of wholesome. So Akusalarasi Sutta calls it Kevalo Akutalarasi, the complete heap of unwholesome. That's the five hindrances. And we possess these five characteristics of the first jhana. So this is the thinking, vitakka, uh, the examining, vichara, rapture, which is the piti, pleasure uh, or happiness is the sukha, and then the uh, chitta ekagata, which is the unification of the mind. So the question that is often asked is, how do we know that we have entered into the first jhana? And um, let's go through that. So when you're steadied in the skillful kind of thinking and examining, so this Vitaka Vichara, there's no longer any bodily or mental pain. That's the first thing that you notice. So of course, this is very helpful. All those aches and pains, sore knees, uh, different itches and, and all kinds of things that usually trouble us when we're not in jhana, they actually fade away. They no longer trouble us. Instead, what we get is the bodily mental pleasure, bodily and mental pleasure or happiness that arises. So this also, from that, um, you get the rapture. So how this is experienced is usually for, for different people, it's different things. So for some people is goosebumps or tingles all over the body. Sometimes it's uh, you feel some kind of rapture uh, flowing through the body. Um, something feels activated in the body. That's, that's really pleasant, really pleasing. It can also feel like the head is tingling and some kind of, of joy or rapture is flowing from the top of your head, like waves of rapture. Some people experience it as tears flowing. So even while you're in meditation, with the eyes closed, it doesn't necessarily break the meditation, but when you come out, you actually see or or feel all the tears. And when it happens like that, it feels like a real purification process. But the most obvious thing about the first jhana is that rapture and happiness are noticeable. So that's the first jhana. The second jhana, the Bodhisattva says, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, so this is Vitaka Vichara, Opsama, I entered upon and abided in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind, without applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of concentration. So what we see here is that we no longer need to cultivate any more thinking and examining. So this vitaka vichara is no longer needed. The mind is already inclined towards jhana. So there's a calming of that process. And in the case of the Bodhisattva, he was still very, very vigilant. He had made so much effort and was very active towards that at the beginning. So his mental development and inclination is probably a lot stronger than what we experience. In our case, we need to make sure that the effort we make as we uh, contemplate the early part of the meditation, like about the uh, being harmful, not wanting to block wisdom, um, not causing difficulties and not leaning to 
uh, Nibbana, when we look at unskillful thoughts, we need to make a very strong effort towards that to really firmly establish it. But in the case of the Bodhisattva, you can imagine that he's, he has certain parami and, and it's a lot more straightforward and more powerful than what we would do. So with the thought and examination, it's calm. And really it's also calm because it's it's a very gross process. You know, it's not subtle. So for the second jhana concentration, there's more subtlety that enters. So when the when it said that there's a settling into inward serenity, and that comes with the confidence of being able to give up the thinking and examining, giving up the vitaka vichara, because you can see that you're deepening the one-pointedness, you're deepening the concentration. And so through that, the piti, the rapture comes to fulfillment. And rapture, what the Pedagogodesa says, is that the mental joy faculty is there. And when it comes to the sukha, the pleasure faculty is there. And then you get the concentration of the mind, the, the unification of the mind again, that, that's the samadhi. So the second jhana, it said, has four factors. It has the piti, it has the sukha, the happiness or pleasure. It has the unification of mind. So the same one-pointedness is still there, but you also have this self-confidence or inward serenity that, that is there. And that is because you're already experiencing concentration. And so you have this inward confidence that's there. So again, the question comes up, how do we know we've entered into the second jhana, concentration? And I think the most obvious answer is that in the second jhana, the strength of the rapture and pleasure is very evident. It's stronger than in the first jhana. It's more noticeable. And you, you get it without having to generate further skilled thoughts. So what you did at the beginning of the meditation, you no longer need to do. It's just you're reaping the results of, of the hard work that was done before. And the concentration in the mind feels firmer and a little bit more stable, if you will. So you, you know that the mind is concentrated. Uh, one analogy that could be given is when you go from first jhana to second jhana, it's like riding a small wave. And then when you go across to the second jhana, you're jumping onto a bigger wave uh, without much effort. And, or maybe that wave is there and you just, your surfboard just, just goes uh, across to that wave. So the rapture then feels like it's pouring through the body. The body feels so happy and pleasurable, as does the mind. And this can last for a very long time, depending on how well you've laid the foundation for this meditation at the beginning. The difficulty comes in with the second uh, jhana concentration after, after a while, after some time, is that this rapture tires out the body. You know, Although it flows through the body, it's pleasurable, there's a joyful feeling, but it has a tiring effect. And it's really strange because it arises from all that rapture. So it's really strange in that way. But if you experience it many times, then you, you naturally want to go past that because you want something that's less tiring and more stable. So that's the second jhana. So with the third jhana, the Bodhisattva says, with the fading away as well of rapture, so pitti cha viraga, I abided in equanimity, so this is the upeka, and mindful and fully aware, so satisampajana, still feeling pleasure with the body, I entered upon and abided in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce, he has a pleasant abiding, who has equanimity and is mindful. So what happens with the third jhana is because of the difficulty with the second jhana, we want to let go of the rapture, the piti. Because we've understood that it's tiring and we want something better. And so we allow the rapture to subside. We no longer focus on it, give attention to it. So we still experience pleasure or happiness in the body. But now we're dwelling with the satisampajanya. And this is where the equanimity, the upeka, starts to come to fulfillment. And of course, the concentration is still there. The mind is still unified. So it said that this third jhana possesses five factors. So it has the sati, the mindfulness. It has the sampajana, which is the clear comprehension. It has the pleasure or happiness, sukha. It has this unification of mind, the chitta kāgata. And it has this equanimity. 
so au pair ka. So the question, of course, is how do we know we've entered into the third jhana concentration? So even though rapture has ceased, this, this pithi, it ceased, we still have pleasure or happiness. So the experience is actually better. It's better in that the body is no longer getting tired. We're no longer feeling like we're worn out. So the experience is more contained, if you will. The body feels more steady. So it's, it's experiencing the pleasure with steadiness. And while it experiences the pleasure, it feels so happy. The mind feels so happy. So if we use the same wave analogy, and just bear with me, these um, analogies I'm using, they're not perfect. But if you get off the big wave that we spoke of in the second jhana, and say you're experiencing so much happiness, riding just another wave without having to manage the peaks of the big wave. It's something like that. So the difficulty that we have arising out of the third jhana is that when the pleasure ceases, you get pain. And then when the pain ceases, you get pleasure. And on like that, that's how pleasure works, actually. So I'm going to use, um, an, again, a mundane analogy, but try not to misapprehend this one because I don't mean this in the meditation. I'm just trying to use it to show the, the pleasure pain process of the third jhana. So it's like when you're sitting comfortably and then pain arises, so you shift because you're seeking pleasure. And so you get the pleasure when you shift. It's no longer painful. But after a while, it gets painful again. Then you have to shift to get the pleasure. So that's not happening in the meditation. You don't need to shift like that. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying in the jhana, that process of pleasure, pain, happens like that at a mental level. So third jhana, what you see is it's still unstable. It's still fluctuating in this respect. And so you want to go to something better. And so that's how you move to the fourth jhana. So the Bod Bodhisattva then goes on to say, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the, previous with the previous disappearance of joy and sadness, I entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. So what does this mean? What the bodhisattva is saying here is that we don't want to experience this constant process of change, pleasure, pain, pleasure, pain, that happens with the third jhana concentration. We don't want to hold on to the pleasure that arises. Instead, we want to become more equanimous towards um, pleasure because we understand with pleasure comes pain, with pain comes pleasure and so on. So what we do at this point is we give up the pleasure, we give up the sukha so that we can go beyond pleasure and pain. So that's why what arises then is a dukkama sukha, neither pain nor pleasure. And that is actually more stable, which is also why uh, equanimity is there. So when the bodhisattva includes the previous disappearance of joy and sadness, there's a few things we can understand from this as, as part of entering into the fourth jhana. This is a little bit more technical. So what I did was I went back into Pethical Bodhisattva for this because it's actually talking about certain faculties that are ceasing as we go through the jhana concentrations and what we end up giving up in terms of the fourth jhana. So Pethagor Padesa tells us that with the first jhana concentration, we have this faculty known as the sadness faculty, Dormanasa Indriya. So in the first jhana, that ceases. In the second jhana concentration, Dukkha Indriya, so the pain faculty, that ceases. And then with the third jhana, the Somanasa Indriya, the joy faculty, ceases. And then with the fourth jhana, what we now must give up, because we're giving up pleasure, is that we're giving up the pleasure faculty. So the Sukha Indriya ceases. So what you see when you get to the fourth jhana is that all four faculties, sadness, pain, joy, pleasure, they've all ceased. And so that's why we attain equanimity with clear comprehension. So that's very technical, but it's it's quite precise. So in many ways, you can see why the jhanas are medicine. They're medicine for these other faculties that, that make us fluctuate in our experience at the level of feeling and perception. So when we look at the next part, we can see, and this is also from the Pethakopadesa, 
It says it's due to the pleasure faculty and the joy faculty that there was unmindfulness. With the cessation of the pleasure faculty and the joy faculty, we possess mindfulness. And this is a very pure mindfulness that the Bodhisattva has. And then it's due to the pain faculty and the sadness faculty that there was the lack of clear comprehension, the more muddle-mindedness. So with their cessation, we possess the purified clear comprehension, the Sampajanya. And then with the fourth jhana, having given up pleasure and pain, we experience neither pleasure nor painful feeling and mindfulness that is purified due to equanimity. So it all comes together in the fourth. So the fourth jhana possesses four factors. It has equanimity, so that's the upeka, purity of the mind, mindfulness, so that this is the sati parisuddhi. So it's very, very pure, this mindfulness. Neither painful nor pleasurable feeling, adukama sukha, vedana, and unification of the mind. So we still have this chitta ekagata, but it's more refined, more stable, more unshakable. So the question we again have is how do we know we've entered into the fourth jhana? So the experience of the fourth jhana is quite different from the other one because you've given up both pleasure and pain now. So for some people, it feels like their head is exposed or open. Some people have said it's open, but there's a certain lightness or non-heaviness in the head itself. There's no obvious heaviness there's no obvious tension it's like a weight has been lifted and in the fourth jhana you feel like you can't be disturbed that anything around you is not going to pull you out of this particular concentration some people have described it as an empty room or a place that is very very still and the mind feels very very concentrated very alert very luminous and very stable so there's nothing outside of the concentration that can grab your attention. Everything has stilled and calmed. When you remain in the fourth jhana concentration for a very long time, you can do so without much effort. And it's also, as we know, possible to go from form jhana to enter into formless attainments as well. So we've looked at formless attainments in many, many sutta meditations, and we've also looked at it in the Chula Sunyata Sutta, so we won't go through that here. And it's also possible to attain to the cessation of perception and feeling. So this is Sanya Vedeya Vedeta Sanya Vedeta Nirodha Samapati. So this arises through the development of wisdom. So uh, Bhavata Panya. And why this is important, and again, you you can read about this in Chula Vedala Sutta, is because Mental, verbal, and physical processes cease temporarily. You get that true taste of Nibbana in Nirodha Samapati. And when you emerge from uh, Nirodha Samapati, your mind is slanting, sloping, and strongly inclining towards seclusion. So that's very, very beneficial. That means you, you get less disturbed about worldly matters, worldly things. You want to stay secluded from sensual pleasures, you, you, your preference is to stay secluded from unwholesome states or the defilements and things and misconduct. It's very, very helpful if you want to complete the path. And the Chula Vedla Sutta goes into the sequence of how you enter into Nirodha Samapati and also how you um, emerge from it as well. So those are the four jhanas. I think that's all that's needed to be said about those. We can now look at the three knowledges. So the first knowledge, um, what we know as trainees, again, just to remind that we are encouraged to just as much develop the four jhanas as also these three knowledges. It's possible for lay people and monastics to attain these knowledges if they maintain jhana concentration. So the more stable the jhana concentration, the better to do so. It's also possible from formless attainments as well. For some meditators, it may not be possible to attain these knowledges until they realize arahantship. Some people are just like that. And then what happens is they all come at once. But for other meditators, they come more easily. So for some people, maybe they practiced in, in previous births, they have certain parami. And so in this lifetime, it, it's entirely possible. and and quite e easeful so the bodhisattva uh, says about the first knowledge when my mind con when my mind concentrate 
<laughs> when my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to the knowledge of the recollection of past lives. I recollected, I, I recollected my manifold past lives, that is, one birth, two births, three births, four births, five births, ten births, twenty births, and so on. Many eons of world contraction, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansion. And there I was so named of such a clan with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life term and passing away from there, I reappeared elsewhere. And there too, I was so named of such a clan with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life term and passing away from there, I reappeared here. Thus with their aspects and particulars, I recollected my manifold past lives. So this was the first true knowledge that the Bodhisattva attained in the first watch of the night. And he declared ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent and resolute. So we, we confirm that, that the Bodhisattva is still very vigilant, still very active in the meditation and with a very firm resolution towards Nibbana. So, he, in this particular uh, first true knowledge, he recollects the past births. So what is evident is the Bodhisattva's ability to concentrate was very powerful. Okay, so very vast, very steadfast. Because in order to recollect what was past births over eons and eons of world contractions and expansions, it, 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 would, it would have been very, very vast, something we cannot even fathom. So not only that, he could recall all the details of those past births from one to another, and I would presume sequentially backwards. So name, clan, appearance, nutriment, experiences, lifespan, passing away and reappearing and so on. So you can see that he would have learned so much from that. Now, what's really interesting is that um, he would have seen births in lower realms, births in human realm, births in divine realms, and over and over. So that's very important knowledge, special knowledge. Um, so we are encouraged to do the same. And the reason why we're encouraged is because it removes doubt about karma, about rebirth, about the noble truth. So we know that the first noble truth is always birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering. We're encouraged because the Buddha says that we've been journeying, transmigrating through innumerable lifetimes with no beginning, no clear beginning that can be found. So when we are able to recollect past lives, we can genuinely see birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering. Through those past lives, you see the, the, the detail of that. So how many births and deaths have we gone through when you recollect past lives? How much misconduct has been undertaken? How many times have we born in, been born into lower realms? How much dukkha have we experienced over those countless lifetimes? Depending on what you see, like some people might only see one previous birth. But one interesting thing about it is, if you have conceit in this lifetime, say you're very rich or you're very um, good status or, or something very smart, and then you re recollect your past life and you see you were actually born in poverty in one of your past births, or you see something in the lower realms, and then after that you see something in the deva realms and you see you come back to the animal realm, it actually removes a lot of conceit we might have. That's also a benefit because that one of the things that we think is one, we, we it's not fully confirmed. We we lean on the Buddha's knowledges and we have sadda towards that. But when we have the genuine direct experience, direct wisdom ourselves, um, it's entirely different. And so even seeing one past birth is very, very beneficial because it can correct wrong views. And anything that even remotely denies come and rebirth, so how do we recollect past birth? So we can definitely recollect from the fourth jhana concentration. Usually that's recommended because the concentration is stable, but 
I've heard that it's possible from other ones, so long as the concentration is stable. It's also uh, available in the uh, formless attainments, most particularly the seventh um, formless attainment. The, the main thing is that the concentration is stable. It doesn't shake because if it's unstable, you easily get kicked out of the concentration and therefore it's difficult to recall past births. So most people think that the way to recall past births is to ask the question of who was I? And actually, that's not the way to do it. That's quite a difficult method to use. You can't easily recall details that way because that's not how the sankharas work, the volitional formations. The method that is recommended to use is to ask, what was I doing in my past birth or my past life? And if the concentration is stable, in your mind, you will recall those sankharas, those volitional formations, and see what you were doing. And so an example that I can give is you might see um, your hands working. Um, and usually past births are actually quite surprising. It's never what you think. So you might see your hands working and this picture comes to the mind that you're repairing something. So an example is repairing a horseshoe or fitting a horseshoe to a horse's hoof. Then you recognize in that past birth you were a blacksmith or a farrier who repairs and fits horseshoes to horses like that. You can maybe discern your age by seeing what your hands look like or other parts of the body. You can also recall other details if you recall the volitional formations of, of doing certain things. So moving around places or interacting with others, family members or others, you, you glean information that way. And the other thing is you can recognize other people in your past birth, but they don't appear as they appear now, but you still recognize them. And in that way, you, you keep probing the volitional formations or activities, and, that, and that's literally how you recollect. You can actually link this back to Paticca Samupada, the pain origination, because we construct consciousness from our volitional formations. So um, when that happens, if you ask about the volitional formations, then you get the answers and you can see the past birth. So some people get glimpses of past birth, like flashes of certain volitional formations when they when they ask in the meditation. But if you're very, very skilled, then you can recall many past births, even eons of past births. And when it's that vastness of past births, they, they appear like, like a film strip going backwards. And what you recall from those vast number of past births are like the highlights the, the, the best sankharas of those past births. So depending on what was valued in those past births, it could be winning something. It could be you were a wheel-turning monarch, a king, royalty. But most of the things when you look through the, the film strip is that all of those things are done out of greed, hatred, and delusion, hence why we are still in, in, in here, why we're still here. So it's funny because... Some people get very intoxicated with this accomplishment and it's important not to do that, to rein yourself back in, not to become conceited if you have this ability because what you're really doing by seeing and recollecting past births is to see that we've been on this journey for so long, like a very, very long time with no beginning and all it is is endless suffering. The important thing is recalling from these past births the predicament you know this birth aging sickness death over and over again and how much suffering is experienced as a result of this when you see it so clearly like that then you are seeing the first noble truth if you see the first noble truth you see all the other noble truths as well because you realize it's due to craving and you want to you want to find out how do i how do i cease this this craving sees this dukkha and then you realize actually noble eightfold path is is what needs to be developed and so otherwise if you don't do that what you see is well you're going to continue that film strip for many more eons stuck in the same predicament countless more lifetimes so as the buddha has said transmigration has no known beginning it's difficult to find someone their suit is in sanyutta nikaya it's difficult to find someone who has not previously been our mother, 
our father, our brother, our sister, our son, our daughter. So even if you recognize anyone, well, we've been mother, father, brother, sister, son, daughter to, to each other. So there's nothing uh, that amazing about that. And the other way to also recollect past lives is to use the basis of spiritual power, the Idipadas. That's also possible. Um, that's confirmed in Puba Sutta in Sangyutta Nikaya, Discourse Number 51, uh, Chapter 51, Discourse Number 11. So we now come to the second true knowledge. So when my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. With the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away. I think I got kicked out for a second, so I'm going to see whether I can share my screen again. Bear with me one second. Okay. Not sure what happened there, but anyway, we're back again. So I'll just con continue reading from this. So these beings who are ill-conducted in body, speech, and mind, revilers of noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong view in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death, having reappeared in a state of deprivation, in a bad destination, in perdition, even in hell. For these worthy beings who are well-conducted in body, speech, and mind, not revilers of noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right view in their actions, on the dissolution of the body, after death, have reappeared in a good destination, even in the heavenly world. Thus, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, understood how beings pass on according to their actions. So this is the second true knowledge again. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose, as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. So this happened in the second watch of the night or the middle watch of the night that the Bodhisattva attained this particular true knowledge. And again, we see the, the Bodhisattva still vigilant, still actively making effort and, and still very resolute in his determination for Nibbana. So this second knowledge is often simply referred to as the divine eye. If you have this particular accomplishment, it removes doubt about come and rebirth. And it's in many ways connected to the, the first true knowledge. And in this case, we see innumerable beings coming and going according to their kamma or volitional formations or actions. So beings who conducted themselves by body, speech, and mind um, revilers of noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong view in their actions, they're the ones that are bound for lower realms or bad destinations because they've had bad, bad conduct and wrong view. Whereas those beings who are well conducted in body, speech, mind, not revilers of noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right view in their actions, they're bound for good destinations. So it's very much like seeing one lane of people going in one direction and another lane of people going in another direction all day and night. And the Buddha also likened it to seeing people move between houses as they go from birth to birth. And, you know, they disappear 
and then they reappear. So that's in one sutta, it does say something like that. So how do we see the passing away and reappearance of beings? How do we develop this? To attain this knowledge, we need to apply or develop the perception of light. So this is the Aloka Sanya. In the Samadhi Bhavana Sutta, so this is the one in Anguttara Nikaya, chapter 4, discourse number 41. So it's a different one. The Buddha says that, and what is the development of concentration that leads to obtaining knowledge and vision? And in this particular sutta, the note to this sutta says that knowledge and vision in this instance refers to the Dibhachaku uh, Jnana Dasana, so the divine eye. And the instruction here says, here a bhikkhu attends to the perception of light. He attends, he focuses on the perception of day. So when he does this, he goes as by day, so at night, as at night, so by day. Thus, with a mind that is open and uncovered, he develops a mind imbued with luminosity. This is the development of concentration that leads to obtaining knowledge and vision of the divine eye. So we already developed the perception of light to overcome sloth and torpor. But when you develop this light, it's really wisdom light. And it's a very important one because it cuts out any impurities as well. And so much of this, like when you think about the, the wisdom light of the noble arahants, for example, the ones that are still in the uh, pure abodes, their light is, is so great. So that's how you know they can see the uh, disappearance and appearance of, of beings. You can imagine that the Bodhisattva, when he developed this, it would have been so vast and so bright. Anytime in your meditation that you've been able to connect to noble ones, you, you realize actually it is very, very, very vast. And again, you know, this is something if you develop your idipadas, the basis of spiritual power, it's also possible to, to develop this, this knowledge of passing away and reappearance of beings, this divine eye. So uh, the other instruction that is quite helpful, which we won't go through now, is the Vibhanga Sutta. This is Idipada Sangyutta, uh, Sangyutta Nikaya, chapter 51, discourse number 20. That's also very helpful for developing this particular knowledge. So the third and final knowledge is the destruction of the taints. So here the Bodhisattva says, when my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability. So you already see like through these knowledges how wonderful and purified the concentration is. I directed it to the knowledge of the destruction of the taints. I directly knew as it actually is, this is suffering. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the origin of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the cessation of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is, these are the taints. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the origin of taints. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the cessation of taints. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the way leading to the cessation of the taints. When I knew and saw thus, my mind was liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being or existence, and from the taint of ignorance. When it was liberated, there came the knowledge, it is liberated. I directly knew birth is destroyed, the holy or spiritual life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no coming to any state of being. And so this is the third knowledge. Again, ignorance banished, true knowledge arose, darkness banished, light arose. I mean, light actually is something that is a very strong feature of these knowledges and of the purified mind. And so this is what the Bodhisattva completed in the last watch of the night. He completely understood the Four Noble Truths, completely destroyed the taints and was liberated from them. And he accomplished all the three knowledges, as we said, in one night. It was so fast for him, but clearly he had been developing parami of many lifetimes. But even in this final lifetime, the fact that they're all aligned for him to realize perfect enlightenment all on his own and to become the Buddha it's wonderful. It's so inspiring. Um, so for us, like with these knowledges, it will take longer. Um, in some instances, not, but yeah, I think uh, it can take longer. 
and know that if it's been developed in previous births, and it may it may actually be accomplished more readily in this lifetime. And as mentioned earlier, you know, some people do need to destroy all the taints before they get any of these knowledges. So it's important also if you are striving for them not to be disheartened, but to to also um, try them out. So where we get to, and we're almost at the end, uh, the last bit is the simile, but where we get to is what you see in that last knowledge with the destruction of the taints, you see what, what the, the Bodhisattva was saying was these three stages and 12 insights. Um, you know, there are these four noble truths, so the suffering, the craving, the ending of suffering, and the noble eightfold path. Um, he understood what needed to be done. So he he knew that suffering needed to be fully understood, craving to be to be abandoned, cessation to be realized, and noble eightfold path to be developed, and that's what he did. And then the final realization, with all that diligence, vigilance, active effort, resolution, that he knew suffering has been fully understood, craving has been abandoned, cessation has been realized, and noble eightfold path has been developed. The job has been done. So that's what that, that part meant. And when it comes to the noble eightfold path, when we take this teaching of the Veda Vitaka Sutta, we can really see why the Buddha was known as the fully developed one or the adept. In Pali, this is Bhavitato, so fully developed one. Um, he's the only one that is called that. And when we develop the Noble Eightfold Path, you've seen this before, this Bhavata Kaya, Bhavata Sila, Bhavata Chitta, and Bhavata Panya. We are developing um, the body because we're developing the path factors of right action, right livelihood. So this is included in our development process. It leads to concentration due to desire, Chanda Samadhi. When we develop virtue, we have the path factors of right speech, right effort. So we get the chitta samadhi, concentration due to mind. When we develop the mind, then we have the path factors of right intention and right concentration. So we get the uh, virya samadhi, concentration due to effort or energy. And then the last one is the development of wisdom. We have those path factors, which is right view and right mindfulness, which leads to concentration due to wisdom, the panya samadhi. So we know that the way it developed begins with right view and we sequentially develop the whole thing. Even in the Deveta Vitaka Sutta, this is happening. We might think that in this particular sutta, it's all about the Vidya Samadhi because we're looking at our thoughts, our intention and getting to the concentration. But we actually activate all of it because if you look at the Bodhisattva's path given in this sutta, he has completed this fourfold development of the noble eightfold path he has activated and developed all those path factors leading to the last two which are not on this uh, particular slide but the right knowledge and right liberation so he's achieved that in the chula nidesa sutta it says the blessed one has developed the body the bhavata kayo developed virtue bhavata silo developed the mind bhavata chitto developed wisdom bhavata panyo he has developed 37 enlightenment factors. So that's what it means to be fully developed. And that's why we train. We train to follow the same noble eightfold path. And so we are called disciples in training. Sekha Salaka. So the last part is really this simile of the large herd of deer. This is Buddha's last simile in this sutta, this Tibeta Vitaka Sutta. And it's really about a herd of deer being shown the right path and not the false one. And the, uh, what he said is, suppose because that in a wooded range, there is a great low-lying marsh near which a large herd of deer lived. Then a man appearing desiring their ruin, harm and bondage, and he closed off the safe and good path to be traveled joyfully. And he opened the false path. And he put out a decoy and he set up a dummy so that the large herd of deer might later come upon calamity, disaster and loss. But another man came desiring their good, welfare and protection and he reopened the safe and good path that led to their happiness and he closed off the false path and he removed the decoy and destroyed the dummy so that the large herd of deer might later come to growth 
increase and fulfillment. Then it goes on to explain, because I have given this simile in order to convey a meaning. This is the meaning. The great low-lying marsh is a term for sensual pleasures. The large herd of deer is a term for beings. The man desiring their ruin, harm, and bondage is a term for Mara, the evil one. The false path is a term for the wrong eightfold path, that is wrong view, wrong intention, wrong speech, wrong action, wrong livelihood, wrong effort, wrong mindfulness, and wrong concentration. The decoy is a term for delight and lust. The dummy is a term for ignorance. The man desiring their good welfare and protection is a term for the Tathagata, accomplished and fully enlightened. The safe and good path to be traveled joyfully is a term for the noble eightfold path, that is, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So this final simile by the Buddha about this deer herd is very rich in meaning. We are like the deer, living close to, if not surrounded by sensual pleasures, karma. So Mara comes along with the intention to ruin us, to harm us, to keep us in bondage to samsara, to endless suffering. So he closes the noble eightfold path to us and he opens the wrong eightfold path leading with wrong view and resulting all the way through to wrong concentration, he uses or utilizes nandiraga, this delight and lust, as the decoy, ignorance, this avijja as the dummy. So if we take up Mara's decoy and dummy, we don't see the danger in sensual pleasures. We, we become consumed by them. Instead, we indulge in craving for sensual pleasures. We get overrun by the delight and lust. And we end up harmed as he intended, as others would be harmed and both. And just like this, the Veda Vitaka Sutta, our wisdom is blocked, if not destroyed. Ignorance grows. We are in an immense amount of difficulty or trouble. And we're away from the right path, the, the safe and right path. So what we take from this is that the more we delight in lust, in sensual pleasures, the more misfortune we have because wrong view, loss of virtue, we are bound to rebirth in lower realms. That's our ruin, our greatest misfortune. But if we follow the good person that comes along, and this is the Tathagata, who has realized directly for himself perfect enlightenment, if we hear the Buddha's teaching, they show us the way out of suffering, which is the Noble Eightfold Path. We begin with right view as we keep coming back to, and this results through all the path factors to right concentration and then to right knowledge and right liberation. As we see with the Bodhisattva, it is possible. That is the safe and right path leading to, to supreme safety. So when we talk about safety, it's not mundane safety, it's supreme safety and long-lasting happiness of Nibbana. So through the method of his instruction, the Buddha closes off the wrong path, removes delight and lust, the decoy, and destroys ignorance, so destroys the dummy with wisdom. And so we can develop this safe and good path, safe and right path, make good progress and develop to fulfillment. So the final statement from the Buddha, the closing statement, he ends with these words of encouragement for us and we can take them as that encouragement and also a sense of urgency as we always encourage each other through these sessions. So because the safe and good path to be traveled joyfully has been reopened by me, the wrong path has been closed off, the decoy removed, the dummy destroyed. What should be done for his disciples out of compassion by a teacher who seeks their welfare and has compassion for them. And that I have done for you because there are these roots of trees, these empty huts. Meditate because do not delay or else you will regret it later. This is our instruction to you. This is what the blessed one said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the blessed one's words. So that's this poet's um, teaching from the, from the Buddha and his experience as the Bodhisattva. So there's, there's much we can take away 
uh, from this teaching. There's much encouragement and also inspiration from the amount of effort and the good qualities that the that the Buddha showed as a 